Welcome to the Business Benchmark Group podcast, where you'll learn how to think strategically about your business and discover that while business is not easy, it doesn't need to be hard. With over 20 years experience in turning stalling businesses into thriving enterprises, here is your host, Stefan Kazakis, the founder and CEO of Business Benchmark Group. Hi, I'm Stefan Kazakis from Business Benchmark Group. And I hope you are enjoying the uh, the podcast series, um, the feedback we've been getting, the engagement we've been receiving and igno- and being acknowledged for. But most importantly, this is a way of us just sharing. You know, we uh, we look at what we're doing through this podcast and what we do through our M five hundred, I guess, sub uh, community events and what we do and what's coming up really soon, our Your Profit Blueprint event. It's more about the giving back, and sometimes that becomes so, I guess, um, expected or so part of the journey that we sort of forget that it's all about value add. And um, I think every one of us has an opportunity for value add, not only in our businesses, but also in our life. Um, the easiest value add, before I get on to the other uh, topic for uh, for our podcast today, is um, the easiest way to value add is just make a decision about how you're going to going to continue being a a, a greater level, a higher standard servant, which is a French word for service. How are you going to be of service to those that you choose to? And and, and by the way, service is a two-way street. So as you give, you shall get, otherwise known as the law of reciprocity. I want to introduce Frank Panisi, the Melbourne Storm football director for a very long time, since 2007 actually. I am so excited to be, again, privileged to hear his presentation that he shared with us several years ago. But he spoke on leadership versus crisis management. And he was ultimately the man who was the glue that held that organisation together in its good and its most darkest day when they were caught doing the salary, I guess, um, the salary breach for which led to championships being overturned and salary caps being um, investigated and, and, you know, just the darkest days from which many of us may be aware of. But what he also shared on the, uh, on the day and what he goes on to share in this podcast is, you know, their staff motto is, I'll disagree, but I'll commit to the cause. They went on to share in terms of the standard you walk by will be the standard that you get measured by. Frank Panisi goes on to share the 10 key qualities, the storm culture. Listen out for that. It is simply stunning. I'm Stefan Kazakis. I want to be winning. I want to be leading. I want to be reacting and dealing with crisis management and not festering or worrying or or being so concerned that I don't have a way through. I wish you enjoy this podcast. I certainly know you will. I'm Stefan Kazakis, Business Benchmark Group. Over to you. So our keynote speaker, our uh, our main speaker here this this morning in our uh, event, the M500 March event of Leadership versus Crisis Management is none other than a, what I would consider the glue, what I would consider the key to an organisation, which is that, that fundamental bit between the operations and the and the op- operational flow and the delivery from the top so it's all consistent coming through so we've got Frank Panisi who is the football director of an elite organization a benchmark organization in the country called Melbourne Storm football director his role is nothing more, nothing less to ensure what the administration, the financial arm, the marketing arm, and what actually happens on the field between Craig Bellamy and the players on a weekly, monthly, season by season basis is all heading in the right direction. And you could imagine in an organisation that would have heaps of ego, fair to say, Frank, how much ego? A little bit. Heaps. (laughs) Particularly the guys that put on the boots every day to go out and train and play and the expectation by sponsors and financial backers and the board and the shareholders, there is one person in that organisation that I believe and understanding and studying this stuff for a very long time that is the glue in an organisation like that. And it's called the football director. He's the guy that must make sure that this team and this organisation and this culture is always in personal best 
mode. It's always fighting through what may have been a win or a loss and get through and shape up for the next game. Frank's going to share a fair few things about um, over the last several years, his experience at Melbourne Storm. He's been at Melbourne Storm since 2007. He has had many, many, many accolades as a coach himself across the world. And he's had many accolades as a player himself. But today he's representing being a football director of the Melbourne Storm. I wish everyone to give him a round of applause. Frank Panisi. Thanks, Stefan. I might get you for next time to do my salary review with the boss, actually. Uh, look, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for having me here this morning. Uh, I certainly don't know anything about running a business. I come from a family. My father's a builder and I've got uncles who've got a typical Italian, I've got fruit shops and, and whatever. So it wasn't that I was turned off not having a business. It's just something I never aspired to. And uh, from an early age, I knew what I wanted to do and get, get involved in a, the game of rugby league. I'm from Sydney and that was my passion and to be able to work full time, and I've done that now for 25 years, and something that was my passion, I feel very fortunate enough. So I'm gonna deliver this purely from a rugby league. It's not about rugby league, but I'm gonna talk about rugby league, because that's what I know best. And I certainly, if I started preaching to yourselves about how to run a business, I think the morning would be a failure, to be personally honest. So I'm just gonna talk about our organisation. As I said, I've been involved for 26 years. I've had some highs, I've had some real lows. I've had some successes, I've had some failures. But I've, I've, as I said, I'm fortunate enough to work in a, something that I love to do, and I'm, but I'm also a finally found a place after all this time that I, I feel that it's something I've always been looking for, and that's called the Melbourne Storm, to be part of it and be able to contribute to it. Again, I feel very fortunate. Um, I'm certainly not an expert, but I, I base this on purely on experience over those 26 years and in the eight seasons that I've been at the Storm which uh, I believe is an elite organisation, especially working across uh, both two codes in rugby league and also for a short time rugby union overseas um, and across an, a couple of different other sports. So I'm able to share my experiences through lots of different people. Oh, that's how I learn the best way. Just even me sitting here this morning and listening to a few speakers makes me think about my role. And I think that's, that's purely my philosophy, You're always learning. Never stand still, I always want to learn and I learn best through people. I've got a heap of books at home. I'm not a great reader, I flick through them. I've, I, um, I studied, it. I did my Bachelor of Education in the 80s, but basically since then in the odd coaching course, it's, I've learnt through experiences and through people. So that's what I'm basing this morning on. We'll go through uh, very quickly a bit of a background on myself, not, not at all, what the NRL competition, what our competition is, and our club. Um, I'll talk briefly about my current role and how, how that works in the club operation. I'm going to talk a fair bit about our head coach, the influence he has on our club and the legacy that he's left and he's continued to leave. Uh, we call it the rise, the fall and the rise of the club, uh, which uh, has made the club a lot stronger. We'll talk about crisis management, which has a bit to do with point four. Uh, talk about our culture, which we're very, very proud of. We don't, don't say we're the best, but we're very proud of our culture. And, um, and look up to this season, and we'll have some questions at the end. A couple of statements that I'll make during the, the presentation, or what I believe in. You know, there's a, a philosophy is, you know, having a team is all about good players. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a fair bit of truth in that, you need good players. But I'm a big believer in it, have creating the right environment, and that's what our role as leaders is create the right environment so the players and the staff perform at the absolute best and improve. And you see so many players in loads of sport, whether it's rugby league, AFL, soccer, whatever your sport, that why are they so good at one club, but when they leave to go to another club, they don't perform at the same level. Why is that? I believe it's about the environment. Maybe they're not going, they're going to a not as good an environment as the one they, they were. Is winning everything. We believe in the second statement. It's about maximised performance and potential. Winning is the ultimate, we all want to win. That's why every day we wake up to train, everything, it's about winning. Winning this week's game, winning, winning the competition. But ultimately, it's sustained success which makes a, a good organisation to a not so good organisation. 
Again, you see so many teams have a win the competition and then they'll dip for a couple of years and they'll come back again. Is that successful or not? I like to look at the Geelongs, for example, in AFL. I look at ourselves in rugby league that maybe not win it every year, but we're up there competing every single year. And that's the, to me, tells that that's more important to us. There's strong leadership. And leadership is just not about the coach and the football director. It's about other people in the organisation. Everyone's got to lead. Everyone's got to lead. But more people carry probably more responsibility and leadership than others, but everyone leads in your organisation to get the very best out of people. We've got to cope with failure and crisis. It happens. It happens and, and we've experienced our fair share. Uh, again, as I said before, we're always searching for ways to do things better. We never stand still because we know there's people trying to catch us. And, for, and, and even in all, our part, we've looked at ourselves, which I'll talk about later. I've got a feeling a couple of clubs that have overtaken us in a few areas. And that hurts us, so we're trying to get better again. Never stand still. Uh, we challenge each other. We have a, we have a phrase with our staff. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll, I'll disagree, but I'll commit to the cause. If that's the best thing for the team, best thing for the organisation, I'll, 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 I'll commit. I might not personally agree with it, but if that's the best thing for the team, so we, we live and die by that as a staff. Uh, with the players, we're always talking about making your teammate better makes us better collectively. So it's just not about me. We've got to help each other all the time. And my role, we've got to get the off-field right and our chances on field success will increase enormously. That's my role. Um, very quickly, uh, I've come from, probably Stefan boosted my uh, playing career a little bit better than it really was. I was a lower grade player in Manly, which happens to be our arch rivals now here in Melbourne. Um, I did play development in the early days at the New South Wales Rugby League Academy, so I got a real understanding of, of the young players and, and the elite young players coming through. I did a lot of coach education in my early days. I, I was at Manly for, for a long time after playing in terms of both the coaching role and, and junior player development. And in terms of uh, coaching, I coached at Manly in Sydney and I did a couple of rugby union clubs overseas. And without picking on some, and also did some international coaching. And I had some great successes amongst those clubs and not so much. And there were some organisations with great people in terms of really enjoyed my experiences, especially overseas. But geez, they lack some leadership, and we show with our with our with our results. Um, this is the football department. We have five departments at the Melbourne Storm. We have uh, finance, commercial, marketing, communication, and football. Okay, basically, most of those organisations raise the money, and our and our department spend the money. That's basically how we see it. So um, that's how it starts. We, myself and the coach, uh, on the same line. We're very fortunate. We've got a fantastic working relationship and, and personal relationship as well over those eight seasons. We report to the CEO, and basically in our football department, we're starting from. We have our pathways, our um, our under twenties, our eighteens, our sixteens. Uh, we have our recruitment area, which is one's getting bigger and bigger. And our coaching arm's a big one. We have a, a different coaches in specialist fields to assistant coaches, development coaches, physios, a doctor. Uh, we've got a couple of doctors, interstate doctors, because we travel every second week. We have an admin area, and we have a very strong welfare. We've got three full-time welfare people. So basically, that's our football organisation. And, and Craig, basic, and that doesn't include the players. We have 34 players, which I'll talk about, and, and, and myself. Um, our playing squad, we've got 33 players, varying from 31 years of age down to 18, full-time players. Uh, we've got a senior leadership group, and I think this is a big thing in our organisation. Our senior are four players, and, and a big thing we've worked on this year, which we found we, we needed it, we've put an emerging leaders group. Who's going to be the next leaders? We just felt that the four players up here, there was too much responsibility and too much pressure on them to run the 33 players. So there's an emerging players and we've already seen some great successes just this year. We've only been a couple of months into it. The way the game is, is at the moment, we don't have the draft. We have free agencies. We have an enormous amount of turnover every year. It's just like it or lump, it's just what it is and we've got to deal with it. So that's basically, since my, I've been here, that's how many players we lose. Uh, that's how many players have come in. So obviously we lose the same amount. So we get from outside the organisation or bring them through the system, which is our preferred way. So we train them early, 
and we bring them into our full-time squad. So we're averaging about 11 to 12 players per year that we lose or bring in every year. It's a third of our squad. That seems high, it is high. Okay, but again, that's just what we've got to deal with, whether it's uh, the salary cap or players moving on for different reasons. We had Alastair Clarkson from Hawthorne speak to us last week, and he's really left a, a strong... He talked about the keys to sustain success of stability and spirit. So when you look back at this and you say, how can you have stability when you lose so many players? And that's a fair comment. It's probably where you lose them and where you keep them. In our senior leadership group, we've got four players... And that's how long in brackets they've been at the club. 15 seasons, 14 seasons, 13 seasons, 7 seasons. That's a fair bit of experience. So whilst we've lost a lot of other players, we're very stable in our senior leadership group. And we've done that on purpose. We've let play other players go. In some cases, we've let two players go to keep one player. But their, their role on the field and off the field is enormous to our organisation. And that's why we're... We're very, very stable in our senior leadership group. Our merging leader, we've got eight in that group, but four of those players now have been there for a while, eight, seven, seven seasons, six and six. Again, it's, so there is a big turnover, but Alistair Clarkson, right, you've got to have stability in key areas. A massive one is the coach, he's been there 14 seasons. Okay, I, 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 I just cringe at European sport, especially European soccer. European football on how many coaches they get rid of and get rid of regularly. I don't know where you're going to get that stability to get success. They're looking for that quick fix. They might get a quick fix, but they're not going to get stability. And I think that's and myself now being eight seasons, and we've got a sprinkling of staff. I think it's important to turn over your staff. It really is. Just like it is your list with you. It's important to do it. Bring enthusiasm, new ideas, and it improves your staff. But you also got to have that stability. And the key for us, and there's been some staff that, you know, I've been challenged by others, why, why aren't we paying more to try to keep that staff? At times it's been the right time to let them go, especially assistant coaches. They want to go to the next level. And maybe I can see some frustration in them. And another year might be one year too long, so let them go. It hurts at times because they become attached to the organisation and, and they're good people and they're good at their job, but you've got to let go sometimes and bring in new blood. But... Only do that if you've got stability in certain areas, which, which is a key one. Um, briefly, our club, we're, we're a very young club, only established in 1998. The NRL competition itself, even though it's 100 odd years old, the National Rugby League is, is, was, came in the same year as the Storm. Um, so in that period, it's been an incredibly competitive competition. There are 16 teams from Queensland, mainly New South Wales, Canberra, Auckland and Melbourne. We play 26 rounds over a season and there's a top eight, just like the AFL, at the end of the year. Now, in the 18 years since the National Rugby League and Melbourne Storm have been established, 10 clubs have been champions, 10 out of 16. That's competitive. So it's not the same teams winning every year. We're in a competitive business. Uh, and 13 clubs have appeared in the grand finals. Only three have failed to make it. So again, we are competing against other teams that are and are competing hard every week, every year. Um, and ourselves, we were, we were at the club. Premier's only in their second year, so very fortunate enough, pre-Craig Bellamy, pre-myself, and pre-all those players in our... The club started on, on strong foundations, winning the competition in 99. But then they had a decline in performances before 2003. And then this gentleman came along, Craig Bellamy. So instant success early, then they started just dipping a bit. And since 2003, Craig Bellamy's been at the club. He appointed for that season. At the time, it wasn't a logical... He, did, he, he wasn't a head coach elsewhere. He was an assistant in Brisbane. But John Rebo, the founder of the club, put him on based on he could see potential. He came from a successful organisation, the Brisbane Broncos, and previous that he played at Canberra Raiders and coached there a bit and had success at both those organisations. He had a very good mentor in Wayne Bennett, so he looked at all those things and, and, and could he fit the culture at Melbourne. And he had certain, his personal qualities, he understands the game. He has an enormous work ethic, not a high work ethic, it's enormous work ethic. He's incredibly passionate, he's self-disciplined, he's very big on his routine. His attention to detail is greater than I've ever seen any individual in any organisation. It's just phenomenal. Uh, he's a strong character. 
you know who's the boss with Craig Bell. There's no grey. With, it's either black or it's white. There's no grey. And he tells some people like it, some people don't like it. But that's, so that's his character and that's an important part of his leadership. But he cares about his players and the players know that. So he comes across as this very strong, uh, aggressive person, but he, he's a caring about the player and, and especially their off-field and their family. And that's a massive thing in organisation. And he's always willing to learn. Massive on learning, never standing still. Uh, however, like any, any of us, in his early days, and he's the first to admit, there's areas that he had to work on as an individual. And he says that his presentation to the players, the team meetings, that needed improvement. Uh, he was very rigid in his early days. It was his way or the highway. Okay, He, he had to change. And get a lot of the, the It wasn't big on the player leadership in the early days. It was just his way, his way or the highway. These days, he's very driven by the player, the senior leaders, and now the emerging leaders. He wasn't great at delegating, he said, and his trust in staff, he was, he, he was a bit of a, a power control freak. Now, he's changed over the years. He's brought outside people in. For nine of his first years, he had a gentleman by the name of John Stefano come in and watch him a couple of times a week, sit at the back, have nothing to do with the, the players or the staff. He'd just take notes on how he presents. And he'd come back and tell, and some things Craig didn't like, but he took it. How do I improve my presentation? How can the, how the players can, how can I say less words, re, stop repeating myself or make a point stronger? So have nine years he had someone working with him. Now he's, he's got a few other things as well. So he identified what his weaknesses were and he improved them. Um, in his 13 seasons, with 12 out of the 13, we've made the final series. One, we weren't allowed to compete, which we'll talk about later. Four minor premiership, which is the first team past the post, like the AFL. Been in five grand finals, three premierships, and been club, world club champions for two seasons. That's fantastic. This, to me, is his legacy. That's what we all look at, and that's what all our fans and what we all get excited about. In his 13 seasons, 62 players have made their debut in NRL. 62. And out of the... And there's been 28 players that we recruited to the club that weren't wanted elsewhere that had less than 20 games experience at their previous club. So there's 82 players that basically he's given a start to. But of, the, of these, 20 have become international players. So it's about developing the players, developing the people in your organisation. That's, to me, his legacy. And of these 70, now are established NRL players. They've made a career at rugby league. And that's what he's ran out. He's a coach developing both young players and unwanted players from other clubs. That's his legacy. That's great, the first five points. That's what we all get excited about. But that, to me, is where his legacy will be in years to come. And he's built a very strong culture and left a legacy. This is a photo that you probably have seen or a long time ago in 2010. This was a couple of days after April 22, which we're nearly on five years. It was, uh, the club was found guilty of salary cap breaches and we got the biggest punishment in sporting history in this country and probably around the world. We had two minor, pre well, sorry, we had two premierships stripped. We had four, three minor premierships removed, the World Club Challenge abolished. We got fined $1.5 million. Uh, it was about, we are about round six at that stage. We had four wins from six games. We lost all our eight points and for the rest of the season we were barred from um, uh, winning, well, well, getting points. We could play, but that we weren't getting any points. We had a whole year of that, 2010. And at the end of that year, we had a massive turnover. And that season, 2010, which will go down as, that's personally the hardest year of my life. After that day, we played 18 games. We won 10 and lost eight, which is, which is a phenomenal record. 2011, after we lost all the players, remember we lost had a massive amount of players, 12 we've lost, and some really good players, might I add. So, like, uh, Greg Inglis now, he plays at the South Sydney Rabbitohs and a host of other players. That was, one of, to me, one of the most amazing years. We were, we, were, we were expected then just to dip. People said, oh, they've only got their success because they've been cheating for that many years. They're just going to go that way. And we had a, a team of no names except a couple of our star players. We, re we recruited one player who was backpacking around Europe because we were just could, couldn't find anyone. And it was, it was a challenge, and we were expected to finish at the bottom of the table. But we had showed re 
massive resolve that year were minor premiers. We were first past the post. We won 19 out of our 24 games. We had a club record of 13 consecutive wins. We were club champions, which means our under 20s and, po and our sales points collated. We were the best club in the NRL. And most of all, most of all, our credibility restored. People started taking us seriously, saying, maybe, maybe they weren't getting successful because they weren't cheating. Maybe they are a good club. Um, 2012, the next year, we, we played 27, won 20, lost seven. So again, we didn't want to say it was just a one year. We got lucky and we won the competition. But even in that period, we had started the season, we won nine games, we won three of our next four, then we lost five consecutive games. It's never been done that a, a team that loses five games in a season end up winning the Premiership. And again, all the doubters, when we lost the five games, it was getting July into August, near the finals, they've, they've run out of steam, you know, this is it, they've hit the, the, their best. They won't, they'll, they'll make the finals with enough points, but they're going to dip straight out. We came back and won the next eight and we were premiers. So again, there's, that was 24th of April 2010. Just a little, uh, we talk about crisis management, is that that hit, it was extraordinary the amount of media press that we got. We had the key players, the coach, myself, had media outside our houses. Not just our outside offices, there was a, they, they found our houses, where we were living, they just wanted to get us on film, they wanted us to speak to us. So it, it was invasive for your, your, family, your family life. You know, your kids had to see that. We were treated like criminals. For God's sake, we, we breached the salary cap, we didn't kill anyone, we didn't rob anything, but we were treated like criminals for a short period of time. And it was for two days, we just basically went underground. And it was happened on a Thursday, the next day was a scheduled day off training and we're playing on a Sunday. And I remember one of our senior players, it was, we were in a uh, complete shock for a couple, of, well, a couple of hours and we just couldn't go outside. Our, our, our gates were just bombarded by media. And one of our senior players came up to me and said, look, well, what do we do now? And I said, look, I honestly don't know. I pride myself on being experienced, but in, in the coaching book or the, my book, at, I don't go to, when you breach the salary cap, this is what you do. <laughs> I don't, I honestly don't know. I have to be honest with you. I don't know. I don't know, Cooper. I don't know, mate. I don't know. I said, mate, I think we just all just stay underground tomorrow and we'll reconvene on Saturday. I said, oh, we can't do that. This is, a, this is a player telling me we can't do that. I said, what do you mean? He said, mate, we've got to get the leaders together. We, we, we've got to think, well, what are we going to do here? He drove it. Cooper Cronk, mid-20s at that stage, 26 maybe. He drove that. So the next day, the, the leaders, we got together at one of the assistant coaches' house where there was no media, and we met and discussed what we're going to do, how we're going to, and it was just day by day at that stage. We weren't looking too far ahead. How are we going to get through to Sunday's game? Because there were talk that we were going to forfeit the game. And, and then we met, and then Craig Bellamy said, look, someone's got to speak to the media. I'll speak to the media. And the leader, and the leader said, you ain't doing that on your own. We ain't going to throw you on your own. And it was basically the player's idea to do that, that we're going to walk behind you and we're all in this together. We're not going to send you out those, the pack of dogs on, on your own. And they basically walked out. So Craig's got a, a prepared statement in his hand. And they walked out from our meeting to a pack media. He read the statement with the players all behind. And that was, our, our, that was, our, that was driven by the leadership group, our, our unity. We're in this together and we aren't, we aren't going to break. And then two years later, we did that. So that was an incredibly rewarding e experience. Um, crisis management, while we're on it, again, you, you learn these, there's no manuals about it. I think the key ones, you confront the situation with your team and they confront it with y yourself as well. Uh, avoid making decisions on emotion. That's one thing we learned during that period because it was very emotive. And I think the calm people they came to the fore and they made the decisions. That's a big one. Uh, strong leadership, but ownership is required. So we got everyone's, in the end, it was Craig and myself had to make the decisions, but we had to get the input of everyone. We, we have what's called the bubble. It's really important, as in, at times our bubble gets broken and we're, we're quite annoyed, is what happens in our organisation stays in our organisation. We don't want the rest of the world to know. We're very proud of it. 
and, and that's, that's a big thing with, say, if you might have a little misdemeanor in, in, in your club that's not really big, but if it gets out, they'll make it bigger than it is. So we're big on keeping things in-house. Absolutely important. It's really challenging now more than ever. Social media has made it incredibly difficult. People like to share their whole life with people on Twitter and Facebook. I, I personally don't understand it, so it's a challenge, but we're still very big on keeping things in-house. We avoid a siege mentality. In the early, when we first started that 2010, for the first couple of games, it was us against the world. You know, stick and wiggle, show them, and it was all about siege. That wore off after about three or four weeks. We said, after three or four weeks, we still had 20 weeks to go, so we can't continue this. For, we'll be exhausted by the end of the year. So we got back to normality. I said, let's get rid of this ridiculous. It's always going to be there, we want to prove, it, but we had to get rid of this siege mentality and just basically get back to get back to routine. And we just ran that year like a normal year, except you didn't get any two points after every game. And that's how we got through that year, just getting back to routine. Uh, getting ready for a crisis. There's only one way, is you build a strong and positive team culture. You don't get to a crisis, and you've got to have that strong culture. And I think I mentioned before, my father is a builder, and uh, he taught me something really from a young age. Remember, I was probably forced in the early days, I suppose, to go and work with him every school holidays and every possible time. And I remember when he'd, he'd build a house, to be, I used to hate the early days when he'd do the foundations. It just take forever, all the time of the foundations. And I asked him, and he said, the house has got to have good foundations. A house must have good foundations. He said, because if you're going to have problems later on, you can fix them. You can fix that little problem. But if they've got poor foundations, you've got to get rid of them. You've got to start again. And that's like a team. If it has strong foundations, when it comes a storm, pardon the pun, uh, if it's got strong foundations, it, it's, it's going to last. Okay? And I think that's, that's the thing. If you've got a, when you do have a crisis, if you've got a strong culture, you, you'll see it through. Um, what we believe, to finish off, our, our 10 key qualities and what we believe make our storm culture. And again, this is for us. Uh, if there's anything that, that other people it might relate to, that's fantastic. But for us, this is what we strive on. We have a massive work ethic in all our people. But it must start from us. We want, if we expect our staff to work hard and our players to work hard, we have to drive the leaders. Okay? And I, I, hopefully Craig Bell, well, get Craig Bell in years, and hopefully I'm with the hardest workers in our club. We have to be, if we expect everyone else. Two, we've got to recruit good people. Sometimes we'll recruit people, players or staff, that have got deficiencies in their particular technical area. But we'll back our system to make them better. Last year we failed in that. We recruited players with some deficiencies, but they weren't good people. Or they wouldn't buy into our culture. We got rid of them because they just, they were a bit of a cancer to our organisation. So we got rid of them. Okay, but you've got to recruit the good people. People that are good people, people that will believe in your culture. If they don't believe in your culture, they're not, they're not, they're not going to improve. <coughs> Three is a big one. It's a Craig Bellamy term is know your job. So what is my job? Whether I'm a player or staff, what's my job? You've got to know what it is. Two, you've got to do your job. And three, respect your job. Now, some people's jobs are bigger. Craig Bellamy's job is bigger than, say, one of our video analysis or our gear steward. But that gear steward or video analyst, his job is, just as, is very important to the organisation's success, and he's got to know that. If he thinks, oh, you know, my job makes no difference, you're not going to get the best out of him. Okay? And he also, big on, if you're going to say, you, if you're going to say you're going to do something, do it. No empty promises. Again, we have meetings, and we'll come back again, staff meetings. He'll rip a staff basically head off if they, if they say the same thing they said, last meeting, I'm going to do this. Well, why didn't you do it? There's also a great Pat Riley. He's a, I'm sure a lot of you heard of Pat Riley. He's a famous US basketball coach. Uh, coached the LA Lakers in, in the 80s and 90s, and uh, in the early 2000s, Miami Heat and he's created that culture at Miami Heat, one of the best teams in the US. Craig and I had a, an hour with him in Miami about two years ago, and it was the most fascinating one hour of our life. I'm just devastated I didn't record it and take notes. He was, and he left us with this, and it took me a while to digest it. 
he, and we were talking about doing your job. And he just he said to us, he said, the main thing is to remember to always keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> and I was, I, for, honestly, the first car I was going, what's he talking about? It, and that, again, it's one of our staff mantra because just worry about your job. It's too many times you worry about this bloke should be doing that. Why is he into doing that? He should be doing that differently. Hey, just do your job. Because if we all do our jobs properly, guess what? We're going to have success. It's, it's part of our uh, human nature. We worry about it, what other people say and do. And that's, that's we're stuck with that. The main thing. It's remember the main thing is the main thing. And even in our job, we worry about job descriptions. That's our job description list. God, I've got a lot of work. Yeah, but what are the most important things in your job description? That many things. Not to say you're not going to do all those things, but they're the most important things. That's why I'm employed to do, and I'm going to do them great. That's the main thing I'm, I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm going to still do those, but that's what I'm going to concentrate. Because sometimes when you try to cover that, guess what? You don't do it properly. But if I can do that properly, and that okay, I'm okay. How are we going for time, Stefan? You getting there? Um, strong team values. Again, we have uh, a big thing we call, uh, uh, we have trademarks on our core values on field, off field. We have uh, no dickheads, no dickhead policy, okay? I know the swans have the same. We, we like to think we were the first. So basically, we are big on our players when we travel, because we travel every second week. We're on planes, hotels, um, every, we say thank you, but, but this seems you th even think, well, what are you talking, this is common sense. I guess what, with sportsmen, it's not common sense. <laughs> thank yous, please. Uh, smile. It's just being, you know, you're wearing our shirt, you've got to take pride. It's about our culture, and that's what we're big on. And when we're out in public, how you carry on is important. So we, we drive that as well. A, t a couple of other things, I'm just going to get to... Uh, Attention to detail, which I've talked about. Be proactive, not reactive. Always what Stefan said, plan ahead. Envisage there may be problems, so what are we going to do beforehand? Be consistent in what we do. This is a massive one. Every week, week in, day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. Pete Carroll, when he won the uh, Super Bowl with the Seattle Seahawks two years ago, he made, a, he made this comment straight away post-game at the press conference. He says, we have a lot of players who have been with us for a number of years and we've been developing our language, our philosophy, and we've been commonly consistent, sticking with the message, and we keep pounding it through. Commonly consistent. The whole organisation believe in it and we all do it consistently. And that's what organisations are. Not just doing it, it must be good one week, next week we'll drop off a few things. It's week in, week out, day in, day out, preaching. And again, that's something again we, we, we talk about. The bubble I've mentioned, a good development pathway and strong leadership. Head coach, staff, players. And again, get back. Alistair Clarkson had another one for us last week. The standards you walk past are the standards you accept. Now, for a lot of you, me included, it gets very time consuming, but saps a lot of energy. You driving all the, all the, the, the values, all the rules, all, and it's, it, it takes a lot out of you, doesn't it? it, it and you're sick of being the bad guy all the time a lot. So again, with our players and our staff and our senior leaders, if you see something, if someone's not wearing the right gear, they're five minutes late, if we're out having a social and they're, they're a bit loud and they swear or something on the field, if you don't do anything about it, you're accepting that. Are you happy with that behaviour? No. What, what, what have you done? I'm not saying be confrontational, but saying, hey, come on, Stefan, mate, just, 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 just watch the language, mate. So again, that, that's a great one. That, that's a big thing at the Hawthorne Football Club. The standards you walk past, whether whatever your role in the organisation, that's the standards you accept. So if you walk past something, you're happy with it, that's our standards. If you're not happy about it, do something about it. Say something. That's about it. That's about it. <laughs> hey, that's <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> All right. Good work, All right. Wow. How good was that? I mean, the theme was sport and elite sport, elite organisation, but the message is one that's got to be commonly consistent. Time for three questions. I'll start with the first one. 
How important is the leadership? I mean, you, you explained to Craig Bellamy. I also look at you as being the glue for that. Because really, Craig, Craig is a very strong, assertive. He's had to be a little more uh, conditional to 2015, let's call it, than what he was in 2005. He's made that move. He's made that decision as a leader. How important is that leadership mentoring, you know, that, that outside looking in and guiding the ship yeah, in the right direction? I was going to go into it, but I, I was conscious of time. Is We've made the finals in the last two years, won a lot of games, but we've gone out pretty weakly in the finals. And we, we, we were really, the way we went out last year, we were really annoyed and really embarrassed. And we had a brutal end of year review. It was brutal. Um, honest. And one thing we found out that we put too much on our, what we call our big three, Billy Slater, Cameron Smith, Cooper Cronk, and just from the playing point of view, and there was a big gap between the rest. So we had to develop these emerging leaders, we these next group of leaders. But quite correct, you just can't say, you're a leader, you're a leader, you're a leader. We had to train them to be leaders. Some, some become natural. So we identified eight players that we thought have got potential leadership. And we've brought in Nick Maxwell, who is, uh, as we all know, captain of the Collingwood football team. And I just saw last Premiership year... Premiership captain. Premiership captain. Sorry, I was kidding. Sorry, Mick Mulder. No, no, Mick, Mick, had, Mick, Mick, Mick had killed me. Mick had killed me. Mick had killed me. But Nick, Nick retired at the end of last year, or middle of last year. Um, sorry, Nick. And, uh, and I just said to Craig, I reckon he's our man to work on these emerging leaders. So we brought Nick in and his role, he meets him once a week, He's he took him away for a camp, he, he works on one-on-one, -on -one, works on collectively, in, improving them as leaders. And by, having, by having eight more leaders in a team, that we've got 12 leaders, it just makes everyone's job a lot easier and it takes that pressure. So that emerging leading group is an enormous part of what we're trying to achieve this year. And it's such an important aspect to business as well identifying talent, having the patience and the, you know, the, the, I guess the power to follow through on building emerging talent is a critical skill that every one of us needs to get better at. Uh, thanks for that. Time for two questions, guys. Anybody? Clearly, there are strong values within the team to create this leadership to get through this process. So I'm really curious about who you partner with and how you align with your partners in terms of their values. Um, and is there, have you, not many names, but are there people that you wouldn't partner with that don't share the same values as the team? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. I think the commercial department, um, um, they come to us with a potential sponsor um, and, 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 and ask us for our opinion all the time. So um, we've, we've only said in 2010, um, when the salary cap breach happened, a lot of jump, sponsors jumped on board. Uh, and one of them was, I haven't got them, the case is one host plus. Um, they did it really respectfully. They said, this is the reason we've got to jump off. Um, he was devastated, a fellow by David Elliott. I'm not sure if he, David's an, one of the greatest individuals uh, you can meet. And David did it really respectfully, told us why, as head of the organisation, he had to do it. It wasn't his decision, but he, he, he got to respect it. And, and so when had an opportunity for them to come back on board, I think two years ago, the way he did it, we, they, the commercial said, listen, they jumped off two years ago. Are you happy to take him back? You know, are you happy for us? And we said, absolutely. He, he's a friend and he did it. And we respect why he did it. Without naming names, there was another sponsor that jumped off. Never approached us why. They just pulled the pin, wrote a letter to the club. And then they put in an ad in the Rugby League Week, which is a, a magazine, and, and basically um, gave it to us and saying, Unlike the Melbourne Storm that are cheats, we do things by integrity. Now, I've told her, you ever take that, that, that mate, there will be a walkout. We will never want them again. So it's, it was more to do with integrity and things coming back. But, you know, I think, uh, to answer your question, that we've never had to say no, but the communication is important that they come and let us know. One more question, guys. Yeah, one of you earlier, nice one of the earlier slides, there was a comment about in positive team culture coming from high performance. Does the positive team culture come from high performance or does the high performance come from positive team culture? Like, is it just in the A scenario? Oh, it is. It's, and got yeah, look, I think it's, um, that's a very good question. I, I think it's easy when you're successful because it's, it's, it's when, you, when those times are, are tough and you're not winning. Uh, you know, we've been challenged, even though we've made finals last year, 
we kind of consider a bit of a failure, to be honest with you. But we, we just, I think it's the culture that drives everything. We believe the culture is going to drive the high performance. So it gets back to when you're tough times, because you can't rely on your high performance, you're not doing well. So your culture, you're just going to continue, and, and then the performance will come because of your high culture. But high performance does help your culture, no doubt about it. Yeah, so from my perspective on that, Raj, there is no way that let's get the result and then we'll think about culture. No chance. Culture is where it starts. The rules of the game need to be very, very tight. And whether we win or lose, as long as we're accountable to the culture, we will win. Actually, there's a great example there. Manchester, there's a lot of soccer. Manchester City, as you know, were bought out about six, seven years ago by one of the wealthiest people in the world, one of the sheiks in... Um, in Saudi Arabia or where it was. And um, they, they recruited a bloke called Brian Marwood, who I'm actually meeting this afternoon. I've had a little bit to do with Brian. And um, the money is just is, is out of this world. I mean, you should see the, the facility in Manchester. It's just, it's like going on a different planet. But in the early days, they just bought all these players and had all this money. They've got no success because the culture was poor. And so he... he it's, he changed, he, got, he sacked people, he brought people in, he, he got the recruitment right, rather than recruiting the best player, was the best player. And the, so they changed the culture, and guess what? The performance has changed. So they had all this money, it didn't help. So it's, I guess another thing on what you're just saying there is that it's regardless how many resources you've got, as in money, if you, you can throw millions of dollars at something, put all the most beautiful, you know, Eiffel Towers in place, but if the culture's not right, then all of that will be, you know, just brass balls. Two of the French, cl uh, French club and the English rugby union club I worked at, probably the wealthiest clubs in Europe, I had no success there in my five years because we had absolutely poor leadership. Had a great time. <laughs> They're great people, but geez, it was poor leadership. <laughs> Round of applause for uh, Frank Benici. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stefan Gazagas from Business Benchmark Group, and I hope you really enjoyed that, that sharing from Frank Benici. Football Director at Melbourne Storm, the amazing organisation that's known as Melbourne Storm. I, lo I love his, uh, you know, upon reflection and listening to that again, I guess, you know, his, his, his lesson that he learned from his father, good, strong foundations is key. Yeah, you know, the reality is that, um, you know, our integrity and our values are two very different things. And yet they are so interlinked. So good, strong foundations is key. I also love that whole, you know, know your job, do your job, respect your job. You know, one of the key qualities of an elite organisation. And why wouldn't we take that on as the business owners who are striving to just raise the bar for the standard that, I guess, defines us? Why aren't we just continuously looking at how is it that I could? How is it that we could? How is it? How is it? How is it? You know, when you really think about it, the ratio of how many how questions versus why questions should always be two to one. I'm Stefan Kazakis from Business Benchmark Group. Board of Directors 12 is just almost upon us. The next 12 months could be the next best 12 months. If you have friends, if you have people that you trust can go the distance, you know enough about us to know that we can and do deliver an outcome. We don't do that on our own. We don't do it for ourselves. We do it because we are a collective team. So I encourage you to reach out to someone that you may know in SME business. I'm looking for you to help us continue to grow collectively our community. I'm Stefan Kazakis. I am the CEO of every Board of Directors 12 program. And I am looking to continue with you to grow our community. Overworked, underpaid business owners is something of the past. Let's go on a journey and make a change together. Business Benchmark Group. For more information about Business Benchmark Group's coaching, education and training programs, visit businessbenchmarkgroup.com.au or call 03 9001 0878. If you liked this podcast, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher or SoundCloud and leave feedback as well. Stefan shares so much value in all his podcasts and we encourage you to go through the archives and listen to other episodes of the Business Benchmark Group podcast. Thank you for listening.